So today we start a series in the book of James, so you can turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we're going to be in the first 18 verses. We're doing a 10-week series through the book of James, and uh, this should lead us right up into Easter. It's a bit aggressive to go through a book with this much content and this much um, just powerful truths, but we're going to kind of do a, do a much quicker pace just so we can kind of keep moving and looking at some things. And then after Easter, we've got some more, some more fun things planned for learning about. So James chapter 1, verse uh, 1 through 18 is where we're going to land. Pam and I now, we've, we've lived in Hartford County now for a little over eight years. We've, we bought our house eight and a half years ago and uh, lived just about a mile up the street. And what is, uh, what's funny about our house, it's one, of the, it's one of the Ryan homes, so it's got, all the, it's got all the features of that, if you know what I'm talking about. But one of the things we discovered shortly after buying our house is that there were virtually no overhead lights in our entire house. So we, we, are, we came from houses that always had overhead lights. You walk in the room, you hit the switch, and the light turns on above it. But none of our house, this, this house had no lights. It, it, all the lights had to be plugged in lamps, and there were switches that controlled lamps or control different weird plugs throughout, you know, oftentimes the plug you wouldn't want it to control is the plug that it controls. And we discovered this when we first moved into our house because we closed at 5.30 at night in the winter, we drove to the house, let ourselves in, and are using our cell phone flashlights to go through our brand new house before our junk arrived to be unloaded the next day. And so we, 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 had, we have to have lamps everywhere in our house. All the rooms that we wanted to have lit until I installed, like, real lights. But one of the things I discovered about myself when it comes to lamps is that I am extremely lazy about turning off lamps. Like, I just don't do it. I feel like I'm not that lazy of a person, but when it comes to lamps, I would rather leave a lamp on for, for four years than shut it off on a regular process. So our family room, we have two lamps that control our family room, and they're kind of weird lamps, so you've got to kind of like reach up underneath them and like twist them an awkwardly long time to turn them off and turn them back on again. And so for like the first couple of weeks of owning our home, I would faithfully, diligently, good to our environment, reach up in there and, and do the laborsome task of bending over and turning my fingers, and I'd shut the lights off, two of them, every night. That lasted for less than a month. Then they just stayed on. And I was like, you know what? I would rather pay the electric company whatever it costs to leave those lights on than to turn them off. Now, it's all better now because we, we bought ourselves this little Alexa thing. And so now I'm just like, Alexa, turn off my lights, and boom. It's done. Now, here's why I bring up that weird story. There, I, I discovered something about myself during this process. I can be weirdly lazy about things I don't want to do. Like things that I find an inconvenience, things that I feel slow me down, that they're not in my plan or my desires, things that I would consider hardships or burdens, whether it's lights and small things or big things. I can be weirdly lazy and would rather just avoid them, leave them alone, and leave the lights on. Like there's something in my soul that just doesn't want to deal with stuff and will and we'll go through all kinds of weird things and obnoxious things just to avoid that kind of hardship. And the same is true. Like you ever try to get like the TV remote and you're like you're all comfy and you're laying on the couch and you're in a blanket and like you will contort your body and stretch your body and like start throwing stuff trying to get the remote without having to get up off of the couch. We're weird like that. We don't like our comfort being pressured. Am I the only one like that, or does everybody else understand that and do those things? Because I, I know that's me. We will go to great lengths to avoid what we don't want to do. And so today we're thinking about hardships. We're thinking about the difficulties we go through life, obviously much bigger than turning off lights at night or reaching for the TV remotes to turn off or on the TV or change the channel. But I'm talking about the kind of hardships that that we want to avoid, we want to get in. And, and we're wired, just like does the same wiring that makes me not want to turn off my lights because it's extra work is the same human wiring that says I want to avoid trials, I want to get out of them as fast as I can, I want to pretend like they're not there, I want to just, I want to get through these things. The gravitational pull that doesn't like want these trials is the same kind of heart that doesn't want to turn off my lights. Now here's the, here's the interesting thing. The Bible has a very different picture of hardships and trials and suffering than you and I do in our hearts. Where our heart is to avoid and to run away from and to minimize and to just get through, the Bible paints a picture of trials that says God uses them in a powerful way to shape us, refine us, and make us more like Christ. And so we have to learn to challenge 
our view of hardship so that we can come under God, a God-sized understanding and let him and allow him to deepen our faith in a powerful way. Because if your identity is built in Christ, if your desire is his kingdom and his will and, and conforming your life to his image, then hardships are the way that that happens. Difficulty is a God-ordained opportunity to grow and to mature and to dive into our faith in a much deeper way. That's the power of hardships. Not to be avoid and leave the lights on for four years, but to be embraced because God is going to do something in your life and your heart. So again, we're, in a, we're jumping into a 10-week series through the book of James, and, and I love the book of James. It's one of my favorite books to preach through because it is so inherently practical. It is so linking to our real life and our faith life. James is ri- the book of James is written by Jesus' brother. So Jesus' brother, uh, Mary and Joseph, uh, their, their brother, James, or the, so it would be Jesus is technically in some ways half-brother, but Jesus' brother, um, J- James, wrote this book. He's called James the Just, was his, was his early church name. James the Just, which means like he knew how to riv- live rightly and sought justice and did what was right. James the Just. He was the leader in the Jerusalem church. He, um, and it was, this is this widespread belief that this is the very first New Testament book. It was written sometime between 45, 50 A.D., so like 10 to 12 years after Jesus Christ. So uh, this is like the very, what we're reading here is the very first book that came out after Jesus and, and helps us to see how our faith works. In fact, this book was written because it was written to Jews who had believed in Jesus Christ or Christians who had believed in Jesus Christ, but because of the persecution of the early church, they were spread all over the world. In fact, Acts chapter 8 talks about as persecution cranked up, the Jews scattered to to places all over the Roman Empire. And so this letter is written to those Jews to teach them how to live Christianity in the real world, how to take their faith and intersect it with the real life they experience. And so I think that's so highly practical because there's such a temptation for you and I. Like the temptation is still there that was there for James and the, what he's writing to address. There is a temptation to disconnect what we believe about God and how we live our lives. There's a temptation to make Christianity a checkbox. I went to church. I believe these things. But then Monday, or as soon as you leave here, so Sunday afternoon through Saturday evening, it's all about me and my plans and my agenda and my life. But when reality is, James paints a picture that all of us, our faith should, should influence and be important in all of life. And so he goes sphere by sphere, and he looks at different areas where our faith should impact our life. And today, as we dive into this book, it deals with hardship. It looks at the kind of hardship that we will face and what that means for our faith. So as we look at this, here, here's my four, we're going to look at four things. And the big overarching question as we read this passage is, what lessons do I learn from hardship? What does God teach me in the middle of the suffering and hardship of my life? For not avoiding it, for not running from it, but rather we're being grown through it, what do we learn from hardship? Let me read these 18 verses just to get them in our hearts and our minds, and then we'll pray, and we'll walk through this pretty quickly. James chapter 1, verse 1. James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Let the brother in humble circumstances boast in his exaltation, but let the rich boast in his humiliation because he will pass away like a flower of the field. For the sun rises, and together with a scorching wind dries up the grass. Its flower falls off, and its beauty, beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. 
Blessed is the one who endures trials because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And no one undergoing trials should say, I'm being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, but he himself, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights who does not change like the shifting shadows, but his own choices he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be kind, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It's a lot. Each one of those verses could be its own sermon. So we're going to dive into this and look at what lessons we can learn from hardship. Let me pray for you guys. God, thank you for this morning. And in the time we have remaining, help me to communicate this, the truth of this passage. As James talks about hardship and suffering and trials and temptations and the need for wisdom, help us see what you teach us when the difficult moments of life happen. It's easy to start going through life on autopilot, getting our to-do list done, building our world and our responsibilities. But when those hardships hit, we have such an opportunity to get to know you more, to get to know our brokenness more, to confess more and more of our sin and to continue to conform more and more to the image of Christ and be transformed, not from this world, but to your plan and your will for your glory. And so God, help us to see the lessons that hardship bring. Help us to learn them when hardship comes, not running away, but enjoy praising you for the opportunity to become more like Christ. It's in, this, in your name we pray. Amen. So what do we learn from hardship? What lessons do we learn from hardship? Here's the first lesson, and it's right there in verse 2 through verse 4, that when hardship comes, hardships bring deeper maturity. The first lesson you can learn in hardship is that hardships bring a deeper spiritual, a deeper soul maturity. That when you face trials and temptations and difficulties and all kinds of hardships, that there is a joy because our maturing of Christ is taking place. Now you see, let's re go back and read those verses, the first four. Here's what he says. Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and endurance will have its full effect so that you may mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, I love this about James. Here he starts out, James, a servant of God of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. So verse 1, hi guys, it's James. How you doing? Verse 2, you're going to suffer, and it's going to be joy, embrace it, and love it. Like, he's not playing around. He's not hiding his words. He's not massaging the problem here. He comes, he goes from high to, you're going to suffer well with joy for the glory of God. Congratulations. He, there's no throttling here. He just comes right out of it. Consider it a great joy, a pure joy, a rich and deep joy when you experience trials of various kinds. I love that idea of joy because it's, it's not like the kind of joy you experience in moments or circumstances. You know, I get a lot of joy when I go get some ice cream. I get a lot of joy on a family vacation to the beach. I get a lot of joy in a nice afternoon run when it's warm outside finally. Um, but I don't always get a lot of joy from my trials. I don't get a lot of joy when things are hard. On Wednesday, I had to be in D.C. I told you this already. On Wednesday, I had to head to Baltimore and then head to D.C. for like for three days of meetings. And I had to leave at 8.15. So at 8.20, I got in my car, and I went to turn it on, and my starter was going, and all I could hear was the electricity. And I had to take my car off the hitch of the trailer, push it out, out of the road, and, um, and put it to a place where I could leave it, find a rental car in an hour, and drive to D.C. so I wouldn't be that late. I was not having a lot of joy that morning. When things started breaking, it was not a joyous moment for me. So this is weird for, for James to be like, find it and consider it. Like, actively seek joy when you face trials of various kinds. 
that's so countercultural to our experience, so countercultural to what we know and think, it only comes from the radical change of the gospel and the hope we place in God for eternity. And I love what he says when you consider, when you face, experience various trials. So it's not just like, you know, consider it joy when you face this kind of trial or this kind of trial or this kind of trial, but when you experience all kinds of hardship, consider it pure joy. When you experience the inward toil of your soul and the sin and the temptation, consider it joy. When you experience the outward toil of living in a broken world with broken people who do broken stuff, consider it a pure joy and a regular joy. So when you experience health and sin and job and mental struggles and tax problems and and parenting problems and kid problems, all those sorts of things, consider it a joy when those trials come in your life. We live in a broken world with broken people who do broken stuff, and we're one of them. And when we experience the brokenness that comes from that in the various ways it comes, consider it a pure joy. Now, there's a reason why we consider it joy. And you see the point here already is that we can find joy because our faith is being matured. Verse 3 continues. It says, because you know that the testing of your faith, in other words, you could say for testing is the refining of your faith, takes place here. It produces endurance and let, in, let endurance have its full effect so that you may mature or be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. So, so when you experience these trials, it's like a refinery for your soul so that you can come out on the other side with more endurance, more maturity, and complete, lacking nothing in your faith. Here's the deal. Even if you and I worship Jesus Christ and are seeking to live for him every single day, you are still being grown. You are still being loved. You are still giving more and more of your life to Jesus Christ. Every single one of us is on that journey. We're all learning to live for Christ more and more. I'm learning to live for Christ every single day and what that looks like. And every single day I wake up with new sins to address or old sins to address that keep on popping up or new opportunities to dive deeper into my faith, to confront pride, to live for Christ, all those sorts of things. And so we are not complete yet. But what he's saying is we can find joy in trials because when you hit hardships, if you keep your eyes fixed on Christ and through that trial, you can become more and more mature, more and more endurance, so that your faith is mature, complete, and not lacking in anything. So trials, he says, are a blessing to your soul. Maybe not your comfort, but they are a blessing to to your soul. And this is a principle, by the way, that's all over the Bible, not just here in these first four verses. I'll put on the screen Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 4 says, And not only that, but we rejoice in our afflictions, because we know that afflictions produce endurance, and endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. Do you want to know why some of us don't have hope in Jesus Christ? Because we don't have proven character and we don't have endurance. And so when our lives fall apart, we run from him, we turn from him, because we don't ever get to the hope that comes through the trial. We've got to push through that to find the hope. And we have to have hope in that. In fact, I love this. We have to have hope in our trials that there will be hope at the end of that trial. We have to embrace that hope. And so if you want to blow a world that loves themselves and loves their comfort away, Go ahead and have hope in trials. It messes with them because it's so rooted only in Christ. There's nothing like it in our world besides the hope of Christ. Another verse, um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which through, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Meaning what happens to you in trials and what happens to you in hardship is more valuable than anything you could buy. It's going to bring glory and praise and honor to Jesus Christ. You know, I think about God in this way. God allows hardships in our lives, not because he doesn't love us, but because he does love us. Because he's like a parent who cares for us and is willing to allow hardships through his love and his grace and his care to deepen who we are in him. 
Now, the best way I can think about this is when I, when I was parenting our kids, and I still am parenting our kids. But when, when, when Jackson and Kaylin, particularly, when they were born, they loved the pacifier. Like, they thought it was the best thing in the world. From, from like, day three of their lives, maybe day one of their lives, they grabbed a hold of that pacifier, and they would, they would use it to comfort their life. It was the best thing in the world. And so um, we, would, we would strategically place them around Kaylin and Jackson's crib at night so that, like, if they popped it out, like, all they had to do is just reach. There'd be, like, 20 of them wrapped around the crib so that like, all they do is reach out, grab one, and we could sleep through the night. It was the best thing in the world, and they love their pasties. Now, Hannah's a thumb girl, so that's it's a little more difficult. But um, they love their pasties. But there came to a point around 18, 24 months where Pam and I were like, we don't want teenagers driving around in their cars with their pasties in their mouth. Like, we probably should start looking at this, this passy issue. And so Pam went away for a hard, for a weekend. She was doing some ladies' retreat, and so it was just me and the two kids at the time. And I'm a little tougher. My soul doesn't get crushed by their crying. Um, so I, I got a little more tough love sometimes. And so I was like, I will break the kids of their passy while you go away. So tough dad comes in, and I rip their comfort from them. I put them to bed without their passy. You would have thought that I was trying to murder them. Um, I pulled those passies away. I put them in a Ziploc bag. I threw them in the trash. They're gone. Then I, but they're in the Ziploc bag so I can get them if I needed to. They were gone. Throw them away. Throw them away. We're not doing them. You're going to sleep. And there were tears. I mean, I, I, took, away their, I took away their comfort. I took away their security. I took away their, their, they call it a pacifier for a reason. They pacify you. But you know what happened? After, after two days, they began sleeping through the night. And you know what happened even more? They slept better because they learned how to go to sleep on their own. Isn't that what God does to us? He allows comfort for a moment to be pulled from us so that we can be better on the other side, more mature in our faith, so that we can learn that God loves us even in these moments. I'll put this on the screen. Your character is more important to God than your comfort. Your conformity to Christ, your character in Christ, is more important to God than your comfort in life. And he's willing to take that comfort away, or I should say allow that comfort to be taken away in many cases, so that we can become more like Jesus. Now, I've got to move faster than this. The second lesson we learn is this. Hardship forces real questions. So if hardship deepens our faith and builds our faith, Hardship also forces very real questions. Look at verse uh, 5. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives it to all generously and ungrudgingly. It will be given to him, but let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. I mean, just hone in right for right now on verse 5. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. He should ask God. We should ask God. You know, I, I think about hardships, and I think about our lives. And for the most part, we live busy lives. I live a busy life. You live a busy life. I've never met anybody that says I'm, I'm not busy. Everyone says they're busy. Everyone lives a busy life. And the danger of busyness is that we don't have time to think big picture. We don't have time to think about overarching issues of our lives. It's, you know, we're, we're getting this to-do list done. We're getting this project done. We have this week to get through. We have this day to get through. We have this immediate, the tyranny of the urgent is just always there. But what happens when hardship hits is that we're forced into this moment of reflection. When somebody passes away, when somebody gets sick, when you lose a job, when all of a sudden things are broken, you are crammed and forced into this moment where you have to think. And when you start to think, you start to ask questions like, why is this happening to me? How will I get through this? When will this stop? What did I do wrong to deserve this thing to me? Like, what did I do, God, that this car is breaking down when I got to go to D.C. to serve you? Like, what's going on here? Who has caused this? Who's got my back? Where does my help come from? All these questions are floating through our mind when we hit hardship and trials. Questions we don't always ask outside of hardships and trials. And that's why I love this verse. If any of you lacks wisdom and you can't understand those questions, then he should ask God who gives it generously. In, in the middle of our hardship, 
God is not some removed teacher watching us take a test, closed book. He is there with an open book of truth saying, I'm here to help give wisdom. And so when you ask those questions, what's happening to me? When is this going to stop? Where does my help come from? God is saying, ask me for wisdom and I'll give it to you. I'll help you. When we want to ask with faith, we don't want to lean into doubting because doubting, as the verse says, it makes us like a ship. We're tossed back and forth. We don't have an anchor. But if we're anchored in Christ and we ask these honest and real questions, we can find truth from God that we're never going to find outside of the normal lives. We'll only find in hardship. And I think it's key that he says ask. That we just don't get it freely. He says if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives all generously. That when we ask, there's something about um, our own teachability that's seen. There's something about our own humility that's seen. That when we're willing to ask God for wisdom, it's like we take the self-dependency, I can figure this out, off of our lives, and we move into a place of, God, I need your help. Like we rip off that mask of, I've got this all together, when we ask God and say, God, I need you to give me answers. It forces us to ask questions that we need only God's wisdom. We need God's wisdom to answer. I'll put this on the screen. The act of asking for wisdom is the key of humility that unlocks the door of God's wisdom for your life. It's a humble step to learn the wisdom that God wants for our lives. And the reality is there is a gospel answer. There is an answer in Jesus Christ for every question that you have in your hardship. There is an answer that is yes in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for you. He loves you. He has secured you. And even in the darkest of moments, you can hope in him, trust in him, and lean into him. So every one of your raw and honest and real questions and hardships can be answered with wisdom through Jesus Christ. And so let's lean into him. Let's, let's, let's resist the doubt that says, I don't know where God is. Let's say, God, I know you're here. I want to see. I need your wisdom. And let's trust him. Here's the third thought. Not only does hardship immature us, not only does hardship force honest questions that need God's wisdom, but hardship also affects all people. This is really important to remember in our hearts. You know, we, we live in a country with lots of affluence, we live in a county with lots of affluence. Uh, we, live, we, live, we just live in a society that, that is relatively insulated from the kind of trials that most of the world goes through. But when we go through moments of hardship, we have to remember that hardship comes on everybody. That we all live in a broken world. We are all broken people. And we all do broken things. And we all experience the hardship of life. Uh, trials are a great equalizer. Everybody goes through them. And that's what James is saying here in verse 9. He says, let the brother of humble circumstances, it's a nice way of saying poor, boast in his exaltation. But let the rich one boast in his humiliation because he will pass away like a flower of the field. In other words, there's two people here. There's the one of humble circumstances, of poor means, without much resources. Let that person boast that one day God is going to bless them beyond their imagination secure for them a future that they could not secure, and they're invested in that kingdom. They're not looking to the stuff of this life. So if you find yourself in that poor, downtrod situation, look to the day that Christ makes it all better. But if you are the rich and you have the resources, boast not in your riches but in your humiliation that one day it all goes away. One day it all leaves us. And he says this in verse 11, For the sun rises... And together with a scorching wind dries up all the grass, its flowers fall off, its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. You know, get the idea? When the sun rises, we all get the sun. When trials come, we all get the trials. No one is immune. And, you know, rich people and poor people can share a hospital room with cancer. Rich people and poor people get in car accidents. Rich people and poor people have health troubles and heart attacks. There are, we are not insulated no matter how much you've got in your bank account, no matter how healthy we go to the gym and work out. I mean, those things can help, don't get me wrong, but trials and hardships come on everybody, and nobody is insulated. And what trials do is they remind us that there's a better kingdom, there's a better hope, 
and there's a better purpose for our lives. And it's not built in the stuff that hardships affects. When hardships pull that comfort away, the sun comes up and things get a little hot, we remind ourselves that God is above it all. We need to look to him. Trials become a great equalizer of people to make sure that we're invested in the things that really matter. Trials equalize us all and remind us of what really matters. So remember that trials come to everybody. And here's the fourth thought. Not only does hardship make us more mature, hardship comes to everybody, hardship forces questions and wisdom, but lastly, hardships reveal how broken and messed up we are. You know, last night I was, I was getting all, Pam, Pam knew it, I was being cranky. I, was try, I, I forgot to buy coffee for the church. I, was, I went to the store to buy like snacks in the morning and then like I just forgot, I forgot we were out of coffee. So here it is, it's 10.30 at night, I finished my sermon and like I was trying to do all the prep work and here I am and there's no coffee for church tomorrow. I mean, if we don't have coffee, it's like the Holy Spirit disappears. We, we, can't, we can't play around with that. So we, we have to get coffee. And so I'm, I've got whole, I've got, the only thing I've got is my own whole beans. And I'm like, I'm not grinding. And my, and my, my grinder wasn't working, I should say. And so it's all clogged up because I grind super fine coffee for a, a pour over. And so it's all clogged up. The grinder's not working. And I'm just, I'm getting mad. I'm slamming it on the counter. I'm like, I'm like all huffy. And Pam comes back and goes, can I help you get this working? Because it wasn't the coffee maker that was bothering me. It was the fact that I'm getting all anxious for church and I'm working this. You know, I, I heard a really great counseling statement once. And it says, if you're having a $100 reaction to a $10 problem, you got to ask yourself where the other $90 are coming from. Hardship reveals our brokenness. And here's what you see in this verse. verse this, is verse six, this is verse 13. No one undergoing trials should say, I'm being tempted by God. Since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So you hear that. When we're going through hardships, and this is particularly speaking of the sin hardships, the temptations of our lives, no one should say and blame God, says, God, you're do, you, you are making me sin right now. God, you are making me be angry at the coffee maker. You are making me sin. None of us should say those things because it says that God does not tempt. No one should say these things. God himself is not tempted by evil. God does not tempt us like this with evil. And so he's, he's clarifying where our sin struggle comes from. And, and our hearts are so prone to blame people. We love to blame everybody. Blame our spouses, blame our kids, blame society, blame our parents. We love to blame any, anybody and everybody for our brokenness. But what James says is you can't blame God the main person you have to blame for your sin is you, your brokenness, your messed up soul. Because he says in verse 14, each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. And when those desires are, are we draw us away, we lean into them, sin is birthed and it's conceived and it leads to a rotted death of our souls. And we are the ones to blame our brokenness, our messed upness. We are the heart problem. It's a heart problem. And so hardships reveal to us so clearly that we still need grace, that we still need the conforming work of Jesus Christ, that we still need to repent from our sins and turn to God, that we still struggle daily and need daily the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, that maybe you got saved 20 years ago, 50 years ago, five years ago, a year ago, whatever it looks like, maybe you need to come to know Christ today. The reality is you come to Christ, you receive his forgiveness, his righteousness is completely yours, you, are standing, you can stand justly before God in that moment, not because of your works, but because of his works, not because of the things you have done, but because of what he did on the cross. And even though we have that complete righteousness of Jesus Christ, the sin in our hearts still entangles us, and daily we have to realize that we're broken and need that grace. And so the Christian walk becomes this, this daily desire to churn up o to over the brokenness of our hearts, the reasons we do things, 
over to Jesus Christ to be conformed to his image. And hardships seem to reveal those much better than the nice days. Days that your car doesn't start seem to reveal those much better than the days that your car does start. We need Christ. And the good news is that God himself has promised us every good thing. Verse 17 says this. We'll close out this passage. Or I should say verse 16. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows, but his own, by his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God doesn't tempt us. God gives us what's good. God doesn't lead us away from him. God leads us to what is good and perfect and loving. So temptations become opportunities to confront our hearts and embrace what the good that God has us, the best that God has for us. How are you doing in that area? Do you allow hardships to turn you from Christ? Or do you allow hardships to clean up your soul for Christ? It's such a countercultural way to think. But when it comes to the things of faith, there is no better proving ground for our faith than the experience of trials and hardships. You know, some of you guys, you, you love Disney World, you love Six Flags. We go to Six Flags pretty regularly. We love amusement parks. And amusement parks are known for, like, their ridiculously long lines, particularly for the good rides. You've know, you got to wait an hour to do this at Disneyland. You've got to wait three hours to do this if you just get in line. And so all these companies and these, these uh, big amusement park people, they got on that idea, and you can buy or get fast passes, where uh, those fast passes allow you to skip the long, boring, zigzagging line and jump right into the roller coaster. Those fast passes just expedite things for you. No more waiting. Here's how I think about hardships. Hardships are like fast passes for your faith. They get you so much deeper, so much faster, if you let them teach you what God wants to teach you. Don't avoid hardships. Don't be lazy like me with the lights. Dive into hardship. Embrace it and say, God, I, wanna, I want you to redeem every ounce of this pain I'm going through so on the other side I can look more like you. And you can only do that if you know, love, and trust Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, who says, Believe in me, repent from your sins, turn from your sins, believe in me, trust in me, and you can have a life everlasting. He died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. I hope you've made that decision, because in that decision, you can pursue a hope that's bigger than your pain. Let's pray together as we close in song. God, thank you so much for this morning, and thank you for that truth. Thank you that in hardships, you're still there. That... Um, that our very breaths we have are life from you. The very trials we go through are opportunities to be deepened in our faith. And Lord, it's in all things we can praise you. In the good seasons when the sun is shining and it's beautiful outside, we can praise you. We can praise you when it's rainy and soggy and cold and miserable in our lives. Help us to look to you in all things. Thank you for your love for us. Deepen our faith through trials. Give us life, give us love, and give us hope in that darkness. But we look to you, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.